those of you who are young at heart. Oh, wow. We are really blessed this morning. The sun is shining and uh, Jesus is Lord. Uh, what else do we require? Our scripture text will be taken from that first pericope, that first lesson from Isaiah chapter 40, where we hear those words that we have heard many times. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. For a few moments, I would like to share from the subject, a faith for fainting and weary youth. A faith for fainting and weary youth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are our strength and you are our redeemer in Jesus' name, amen. In his classic work entitled, A Tale of Two Cities, a book my parents brought for us when we were children and had it on their bookshelf. Charles Dickens tells a powerful story of love and mistaken identity and the ultimate sacrifice of self during the French Revolution. A time in history when everything was topsy-turvy in the culture and in society. It was an out-of-pocket time a time when government and religion did not seem to have the answers to satisfy people who were irate and outraged and depressingly displeased with the low pay and no pay and high inflation and dangerous working conditions at that time in France, all while the wealthy elites were getting wealthier and wealthier and the lower income classes got poorer and poorer and poorer. It was a time, young people, that sounds eerily like, eerily like, eerily like what's going on today in North America as the very wealthy of this age don't have to worry about repaying student loans. President Biden, God bless him, early in his term talked about forgiving student loans, forgiving student debt. $1.6 billion worth of student loan debt is hanging out there, needing to be paid off. 44 million young people, disproportionately Black students, are stuck with high loans to pay back and not enough money because they're not being paid enough on their jobs to pay the loans back. Well, during the days before the French Revolution, the wealthy elites did not have to worry about a variety of loans or the quality of their schools or whether their streets would be paved correctly. Y'all know how the streets are, are here in Michigan. Or whether they would have safe drinking water or whether there would be a Kroger store within easy dr driving distance. They didn't have to worry about having to pay the highest car insurance in the nation, because even though they had the most money, they had the lowest premiums to pay. So when the wealthy French teens in Dickens' novel held from wealthy suburbs like Rose Point, Michigan, and they turned 16 years old, they didn't have to ride dirty. Like many of our young people have to ride dirty without the proper papers, but those who had the least amount of money were forced, forced to pay the most. Sisters and brothers, young people, what was happening in Dickens' novel sounds a lot like what is happening in the cities of North America, more specifically Detroit, Chicago, New Jersey, New York, Memphis. And Dickens begins his novel with these immortal words. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was an age of foolishness. 
It was the epoch or season of incredulity. Folk weren't believing much in anything. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Calvary Dickens sounds like he is describing prophetically our times. 2022 America. 2022 our global society. And the times of the people in the prophet Isaiah's day. The people in, prof in, in, in the in, in, prophet, in the prophet Isaiah's day were living in Jerusalem and other promised land, cities and hamlets and towns. Some were wealthy, some were very, very poor. But all of them were about to face being taken over by another nation and people. Another nation, another people who believed in different gods, who practiced a different morality and spirituality, a people who ate different foods, who listen to different kinds of music and dance to a different beat and who worship different gods, the Babylonians. You could describe Isaiah's day leading up to that time of Babylonian captivity as the best of time and the worst of times. Young people, the time in which we find ourselves living today is also a time when both the best and the worst seem to coexist. A time when hope and despair are living together under the roofs of our minds and hearts. Studies on mental health are revealing that before and especially during and after this pandemic, youths and young adults were and are suffering from emotional stress and anger and doubt and cynicism at higher levels than most other demographics. This best of times and worst of time experience has been difficult for many of our youths, wealthy or impoverished or in the middle. It's been difficult for our young people to process and negotiate all of these changes that all of us are facing. Because of all of the rapid and seismic shifts and changes that are happening in our culture, the best and the worst seem to be dancing around our households and on our jobs and in our places of play and worship, holding hands together, the best and the worst. Together, the best and the worst are playing in the yards and classrooms of our school systems, our economy, our ecology, our entertainment, and even in our faith communities. The best and worst of what could and is happening seem to be playing a game of tag, you're it. Best of times, you're tagged and you're it today. Worst of times, you're tagged and you're it tomorrow. And as we listen to the news, if we dare listen to the news, and young people, I would encourage you to listen to the news. As we listen to the news and as we listen to our friends and classmates, and parental figures, we can tell that we are experiencing both the best and the worst today as a society and as a people. Think about all that our youths have had to deal with and process in the last few years. The best and the worst are partners in their experiences. Best of times. Some might say in regard to the social advancements we have made with a deepened sensitivity and acceptance and tolerance and embrace of those who look different and sound different and express themselves artistically differently and socially and romantically different. But at the same time, others say it is the worst of times because we have now lost what were once important ethical and moral pillars which help guide human expression and moral boundaries from everything from drug experimentation to human sexuality, to our fetishes with guns and violence, to how we talk to one another online or in person, sometimes with no respect, sometimes with a whole lot of respect. You know how many, once they get behind those keyboards online, feel like they've been given all kinds of powers to say whatever they want to say, sometimes it's very good, sometimes it's very, very negative. The best and the worst together. 
On the one hand, while access to academic and intellectual resources have increased online, I mean, young people, if you are in high school right now, you can YouTube various lectures in history, social studies, economics, psychology, the humanities, and the social sciences. Lectures once only given and reserved inside of the Ivy League schools. These lectures can now be accessed and downloaded for free outside of those schools. Or one can find helpful video or live stream lectures and courses from a local community college. Lectures and courses that will help you to solve those math problems that have been stumping you for the last few weeks, the last few months, and maybe like it used to stump me, they used to stump me for the last few years. I struggled with algebra, young people. I struggled with trig and geometry, young people, while my dad was a math wizard and my sister too. Because I struggled with the abstractions of numbers and the patience it takes to solve those numeric abstractions, usually I got low grades in math until college. But with YouTube now or some other video streaming service, oh, I might have made out much better. And now you young person can watch someone demonstrate how to solve these sometimes complicated equations or in the realm of literature. I'm just talking about the best and worst of times. Stay with me. In the realm of literature, we can learn online how to look for those interpretive clues as we read on our Google books or Kindle applications, books like I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings or Baldwin's The Fire Next Time or works by Zora Neale Hurston, Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, Toni Morrison, or works like the Nigerian author Chinua Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart, or Octavia Butler. Oh, she was a sister who wrote some stuff wilder than what Jordan Peele can put together. Octavia Butler wrote riveting and graphic science fiction novels, one called The Parable of the Sower. Today, we can pick up our phones or electronic devices, download these books, and read this good information because it's right at our fingertips. Best of times, but it's also the worst of times. We now have more explicit, what's the word, ratchet, wretched, violent, argumentative, squalid, perverse, misogynistic, pornographic, racist, blasphemous. We have all of this unhealthy stuff floating around with unhealthy doses of misinformation and conspiracy theories circulating right at our fingertips. Young people, we've got to be careful when we explore online. We've got to be discerning and ask for someone to talk to us if we've got questions about things we're looking at. There's a whole lot of misinformation. I remember as I first started teaching history and social studies at a high school in Inkster, Michigan in 2018. I remember having to spend the first half an hour of several of my classes debunking conspiracy theories that students were convinced were true. One was, one was, one was, and it was floating around the classroom, one was based on something that had been viewed on YouTube and had been taught to these students by a long-term sub who taught it like it was the absolute truth until she got fired. And it was, let me give you an example of one. She taught from a YouTube video that, no, it wasn't the FBI. It wasn't James Earl Ray, who was the one who set up and assassinated Dr. King, it was Jesse Jackson. And they believed this. And so it took a good 45 minutes to debunk that one conspiracy theory. We had to go to some places, do a little research, look at some other things online, but they swore up and down. I don't like Jesse because he's the one who killed Dr. King. It is the best of times. 
and the worst of times. And when this is our reality and we begin to see the devil turn up the fire and we start seeing more of the worst coming into view, then Babylon is right around the corner waiting to pounce upon all of us. Babylon is the place and state of chaos, confusion, anarchy, and idolatry where anything goes other than faithful worship of and the obedience to the one true God revealed through the Jewish liberation story and Jesus Christ. New forms of racism and classism and sexism and skepticism have impacted all of society and our, our Babylon today. Couple this with global warming, a heat wave last week, Floods from St. Louis to Kentucky earlier this week and just a few days ago and world wars threatening us. And it seems like Babylon is encroaching upon us young people while both the political and religious arenas struggle to offer coherent solutions and answers. Sometimes the church doesn't, just doesn't seem to have enough answers. Sisters and brothers, you, we know it is sometimes difficult to get trustworthy answers to the questions you have through government, through school, and even many churches today. It's just a struggle. Babylon is at the doorway of the church. A recent story coming out of New York is that we have seemingly self-appointed bishops who are decked in hundreds of thousands of dollars of jewelry Trust me, this did not cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. On top of, they're wearing this jewelry on top of and underneath their clergy cassocks, their vestments as preachers, their wives. Y'all heard the story, some of you, are decked out in the same expensive jewelry. And during a live broadcast of their worship service, as the bishop was preaching, a young man Robbers and thieves invade the service and take whatever they want to take. And they knew that he had on a certain uh, kind of jury that was worth a certain amount. And they knew he had jury underneath his casa. And they took it. And there are at least whisperings that possibly the preacher himself, who has a record, a criminal record for fraud, and is offering $50,000 reward money he might be involved in an insurance scam. I don't want to cast aspersions on this brother. I don't know him. He might be just as innocent as anyone else. But these are the whisperings. And it shows that Babylon is showing up in some churches, especially churches not named Calvary Presbyterian. When they do not place most of their spiritual attention and energies on studying the words and principles of Jesus Christ and the apostles and the prophets in ways that factor in love, holiness, service beyond ourselves, and emphasizes outreach and community uplift as we plan and pray to appeal to potential younger members in ways that move us from study into practice for the benefit of the neighborhood made up of young and older folk alike, when congregation sisters and brothers, I'm just talking about Babylon encroaching, when congregations spend more time debating and arguing about how many lick licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pot? Or how many grains of salt does it take to fill up the salt shakers in Fellowship Hall for our fellowship dinners and church wars break out over such non-issuing issues, then Babylon is here. And young people are disturbed and are weary and faint. I've served a church in the past. I'm not going to tell you the city, but there are some who could testify that what I'm about to say is the truth. This church has spent years trying to purchase certain property next door to the church's parsonage. It was vacant property, it was nice property. We were thinking about a community garden, maybe putting up uh, some place where the young people in this very impoverished community could recreate. The church had been trying to get this property for at least five years. We had a change in leadership. One of the newer leaders 
made a few calls and got this property for $99. It was ours. Do you know that because of who made the call and made it happen, there was a war in this church over the property that the church now possessed. And the members of the church, some of the members, some of the leaders, said, well, you know what? We're not going to mow that property. We're not going to shovel the sidewalk in front of that property. I'm telling you what I know, not what I heard. And when we have difficulty like this happening in the church, Babylon has come in. When the best and worst are present, and then rapidly we start seeing more of the worst, we are seeing and hearing Babylon knocking at the door. And though young people have a lot of natural energy and vitality, even as they start seeing the worst more than they see the best, then even our youths can grow weary and faint and become despondent and depressed to the point that they will just give up. They'll give up on church. They'll give up on church folk. They'll give up on church mess. They'll give up on God. Natural youthful energy is good. And young people have it by the tongue. But when Babylon encroaches, supernatural energy is needed to deal with the pressures and the stresses. But, but sisters and brothers, you and our young at heart, God has wondrous news for those of us who are beginning to see more and more of the worst than the best. God raised up a prophet named Isaiah, whose name meant God saves one of the greatest prophets in Judeo-Christian history. And God was going to use him to speak a saving word to God's people, younger and older alike, who were beginning to become confused, overwhelmed, angry, depressed, and without hope. As the best of their time seemed to be fading, and all that they had in front of them seemed to be the worst, Isaiah shows up on the scene, led by God, and he's been prophesying, if you read the book for 39 chapters, that the worst was coming, the worst is coming, the worst is coming. For 39 chapters, the worst is coming, the worst is coming, because Israel and Judah would not live right before the Lord. Consequently, they had to deal with the cruel and mean and vicious and violent Assyrians. And in just a little while, they would be dominated and taken into captivity by the Babylonians for almost 80 years. And Isaiah is prophesying in these first 39 chapters that things were going to go from bad to worse because God's people were always turning away from the only one who could help them and not repenting. But sisters and brothers, here's the amazing thing about our God. God was about to do something for them despite their contrary positions and sinful rebellion. A remnant of believers. And then down the road in the future, the entire population would see the ushering in of a new spiritual, social, governmental, financial renaissance, despite their sinfulness. Because God was going to show up while they were in Babylonian captivity. God would raise up young leaders like Ezekiel. He was a young prophet. Daniel, a young man. And the three Hebrew young folk whose real Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, not Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Those were their slave names. But their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were all young. But even in captivity, young folk were going to have spiritual vitality, vibrancy, victory, and hope. And down the road, Isaiah starts to prophesy, God was going to show up not only in traditional ways, but God was going to show up in future generations in the marvelous and mighty presence of God's Messiah, Jesus Christ. Therefore, all Jerusalem, all Israel and Judah, all flesh would see the Lord together, according to verse 5. And this good news is available because young people, God is faithful even when God's people are not faithful. Don't leave here without that message. 
Young people, God is faithful even when God's people are not faithful, faithful, even when your mama's not faithful, even when your daddy's not faithful, uh, faithful, even when your uncle's not faithful, even when the mothers of the church and the elders and the deacons and the preacher is not as faithful as they should be. God is faithful. God is faithful. The people of God had gotten beside themselves. Grandparents, parents, youths were tuning out God and turning it up at every opportunity. And they were skeptical of God's word. They were facing a rough future, but God would be gracious anyhow. How many of you have ever received some anyhow grace? Oh, you can just wave it, some anyhow grace. And so God tells Isaiah in essence, Isaiah, for 39 chapters, I have warned my people through you and told them that nations were going to discipline them and there's going to be a very rough patch. But now in the midst of this, I want you to change your tune. Verse, I mean, chapter 40. Change your tune. I want you to, he says in verse one, I want you to comfort my people. Give them some good news, but some true news. Don't give false hopes and pipe dreams based on lies, that if they will just give a certain amount of money or utter certain words in worship, things are going to be okay. But give them my prophetic promise, which will give strength to all my people, but especially to my fainting and sometimes fickle and weary you. Because I'm going to need those young people to have hope in times of hopelessness because a new chapter is coming. And as they move from adolescence to adulthood, to becoming mature followers of me, they will help to rebuild a new temple that the Babylonians are going to destroy. A new Jerusalem that the Babylonians are going to destroy. A new society after Babylonian captivity. I'm going to need these young folks. So start preaching some words of comfort. And so this is how chapter 40 of Isaiah begins. Comfort my people because better is coming. Even after the worst of times, there is still a reason to hope. And this is what God has given me to say to you, young people, and those who are young at heart. Though it is the best of times and the worst of times sometimes at the same time, though some days are rough and might seem hopeless, especially as we listen to the news and listen to our classmates and friends, Sometimes as we listen to our boyfriends and girlfriends and they only got themselves at the top of their priority list and it seems like things are going from bad to worse, God has not forgotten you. Yes, we live in a sinful culture, but God has not forgotten you. Yes, we have at times engaged in ratchet behavior ourselves, but God has not forgotten you. Yes, we've said some things we shouldn't have said and reached out for some things we shouldn't have reached out for, but God has not forgotten you. Oh, praise God. Isaiah says God has a tender word for us. So prepare the way of the Lord, Isaiah writes. Every valley, every depression, every doubt about your faith, and about your meaning for life. Every impoverished situation, Isaiah says, every valley, every lack and need you've experienced, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain, every exalted and arrogant high level official who denies that they were planning to overthrow our government, every mountain will be lowered. Every classmate who arrogantly criticizes you and has ostracized you and teases you, every mountain, every impassibility and impossibility, every fear you had of not being all that God desires you to be will be made known. And finally, finally, Isaiah begins addressing youth directly in this 40th chapter. Isaiah and the spirit raises a question and it's to the young folk too, to those young folk who seemingly were becoming faint and weary. Isaiah asked the question 
as bad as things look, have you not read, have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, this God, our God, your God, does not faint or grow weary. Oh, sisters and brothers, to know that God is always alert. God is always woke. God is always awake and aware. To know that God doesn't faint, falter, or fall is great news if you feel like fainting, faltering, and falling. God is not on the verge of a nervous breakdown, overwhelmed by what's happening in our lives, in your relationships, in our city, in the world, even in this church. God does not faint or grow weary because his understanding is unsearchable, the prophet says. God's understanding is unsearchable. It's unsearchable. God knows the ins and outs of every problematic situation. God knows how to help you and me to negotiate all of our rough waters. Facing a relationship dilemma, young person, God understands it backwards and forwards. Facing baby mama and baby daddy drama, God understands the ins and outs completely. Facing sickness or disease, facing a weakness, weakness, weakness rather, a weakness I'm going to get it right. Weakness that you just can't conquer. A sin that has you addicted. Facing a negative, nagging self-image. Facing some bullies. God understands your dilemma backwards and forwards. And God wants to help. And as I go to my seat, that's the promise that Isaiah gives the young people in that entire community. That help was coming. Because it's one thing to know that God's wisdom is unsearchable and it's deep and it's profound. It's another thing to know how, how do I access that information? And the prophet says something wonderful. The prophet says, look, this is the way we access, this, access the information. God does something. God initiates something. The text says, God gives. God gives. We can keep searching. We can keep praying, but at a certain point, we got to rely on the grace of God. The text says God gives something to us that we can't get without God giving it. In verse 29, God gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. God gives a resource of power from a reservoir of God's own power. Strength we need now and as Babylon encroaches. Oh, some young person needs to commit verse 29 to memory because the promise, even though we get tired, even though we are tested, even though we feel exhausted and frustrated and pessimistic and faint, it is this, that God gives strength to those who feel like faint. But preaching now, before you sit down, you haven't given me any practical application. You've been up there preaching and sweating. How does God give? Well, he gives in a variety of ways. God will show up in the form of a godly friend when you're tired and worn out, who speaks life into your very weary soul. God will show up in the form of a gentle breeze that as you're walking, caresses your face and heart with renewed freshness. God will show up in a sermon or a song or a scripture or a biography, or even God will stop by and show up in a movie. You're watching the drama from one perspective. Then all of a sudden you begin to get a ray of hope as you walk and watch that script being played out. And the actors in the plot start talking to you from that screen. He gives strength to the faint and might to those who have no strength. Because even yous will faint. Even yous will get weary. Even yous will fall exhausted. Those who wait. There is a condition. I almost didn't want to tell it to you. That's why I got quiet. There is a condition to this. The text says that those who wait on the Lord. And the Hebrew for this word wait doesn't mean you just sit passively, twiddling your thumbs. This wait means that you're being proactive. You're still serving in whatever ways you know to serve but you're anticipating that God has a blessing for you. Oh, the condition is that those who wait on the Lord in this way, they will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like an eagle. They will run and not get weary. They will walk 
and not faint. Oh, that's good news if you're tired and weary and worn. And he says it'll happen as we study an eagle. An eagle is a peculiar bird, that majestic king and queen of the skies. The way it flies, it does not fly by expend, expending a lot of energy flapping its wings. But the eagle stands at a high altitude. And when it waits for just the right air current, it knows it's time to leap off the edge. Because when that air current, which is supplied by God, comes along, all the majestic bird has to do is stretch out his arm and it catches that breeze, that wind, and it flies like no other bird. Sisters and brothers, that's all you got to do as a Christian. You've got to stretch out your wings in prayer. You've got to stretch out your wings in faith and wait on God and he'll give you strength. He'll renew it. Oh, my sisters and brothers. We got blessings upon blessings upon blessings that God wants to impart. But we have to do our part. But as we do, we'll run and not get weary. We'll walk and not faint. Maybe there's one here today want to give your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate eagle. The story is told of a, a farmer and a bird expert. The farmer finds this unusual egg. It's the egg of an eagle. He takes it home to his chicken coop. He places that egg with the, the chicken eggs. And of course, out from that egg is born an eagle. But initially, it's scratching around in the dirt, pecking around just like the other chickens, because that's all it knows. A bird expert comes by the man's farm and says, hey, why do you have this great bird with the chickens? And the farmer said, well, at this time, by this time, the eagle doesn't even realize it's a chicken anymore. It just scratches around in the dirt like all the other chickens. The bird expert said, let me have that, let me have that eagle just for a little while. So the bird expert took the eagle up to a mountain and said, stretch out your wings. The bird didn't understand. Took it to the other side of the peak. Stretch out your wing. Nothing happened. And then just a little later, as that bird was looking around confused, that bird saw other eagles flying in the sky. And so that, that eaglet tentatively stretched out his wings. And then the bird expert, of course, pushed it a little bit. <laughs> but it caught just the right breeze and started to fly. It was the bird's vision of other eagles that blessed it. And I've just stopped by to say that Jesus Christ is our ultimate eagle. He's flown over every situation and always depended on the spirit of God for refreshing. Is there one here today you want to be saved? You want to give your life to Jesus Christ? You want to join the Calvary Presbyterian Church? I invite you to come. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Won't you come? There should be a number on the screen if you're watching via Zoom. Won't you come? The number is Eric 313.